All right, there we go. I am going to turn off my video just to make sure that the sound and everything works out all right. Um, so I'll stop my video and you get to see the Tucson Audubon logo there. I just want to welcome everyone again. My name is Luke Saffer. I'm the Director of Engagement and Education for Tucson Audubon. And we get to talk about where some of the best spots to go birding during spring migration, specifically late March, April, May, the best some different spots that here in Southeast Arizona go to, what to expect and uh, how to how to kind of bird the area. And so we'll look at a few spots. I'm gonna bring up my, my PowerPoint here and share my screen. And let's see, share with sound, always do that. All right, so everyone should be seeing a, a cool cast of the kingbird here. It seems to be like one of the birds that I really associate with this time, kingbirds and flycatchers and warblers, vireos, all sorts of different birds coming up through, um, uh, up from Central America, South America, Mexico, up in uh, the Southeast Arizona region, some to breed here, some to go even further north. And cast of the kingbird is one of those, a few over winter here, but you know, uh, many of them come in uh, in April. So we'll start seeing those and hearing those here pretty soon. In fact, I, I was even uh, down at the Danza Trail for the Hawk Watch last week, and we had uh, quite a few cats and kingbirds already starting to come through. So it's pretty cool. Uh, it's, uh, you know, spring is here. So um, it's very exciting. So where to go? This is a, a series of talks that we've been doing over the years now. We started back in 2020 and many of these where to go burning uh, classes presentations are available on our YouTube channel too. So if you're interested in some other spots, uh, feel free to go back onto our YouTube channel. I'll put a link in that in our follow up email. You can go and learn about some other locations. But of course, we can't get to all the best burning spots in, uh, in one session. Uh, and I wanna try and look at some uh, a couple that haven't really talked about in the past. And here's the thing, when you bird here in Southeast Arizona in late March, April, May, there's really no bad spot uh, to go birding. There's, <laughs> there's just birds coming through all over the place. You know, like Paula was sharing, she had a hooded oriole, which you see here, a hooded oriole in her backyard this morning. So, and people talking about cardinals and in their backyards and Scott seeing a northern beardless trannulate right in his neighborhood up in the Catalina foothill. So, you know, there's just a lot of birds coming through. And so just about any spot you go to can be really good. Some of my favorite spots this time of year, oh, of course, Patagonia Lake State Park. Um, it's just incredible walking down through the burning trail. I love uh, Box Canyon, which is just north of Madera Canyon. Uh, the top of Madera is always really good, especially in April for, for owls. Laying a filter up there in April uh, is really, it's a special time to be up there. Empire Ranch in the grasslands, the uh, parent area there in La Cienegas, fabulous spot for migrating birds. I put Gordon here at Bashi Campground. That's a uh, campground on your way up Mount Lemon. And I put that specifically at uh, the Scott Hills tend to come through there in April. And I love Scott's Orioles. Uh, Orioles are one of my favorite birds, uh, especially Scott's Orioles. They have a beautiful song. Uh, I should have probably put the song on here. Well, I don't have this Scott's Orioles picture, but uh, uh, that, yeah, that's why I put the here Bashi campground on there. Oh, come on. Okay. Uh, if you are on here, if you, if you could put yourself on mute, that would be really helpful. Thank you so much. And let's see your ask any question or something like that. So lots of different spots. Um, you know, as we bird this time, there's uh, something to think about when it comes to birding this time of year is that um, just as sometimes there are seasons, you know, there are seasons for everything, right? And so for birds, there are seasons where they come through and uh, different birds arrive at different times. Okay, so, so that's really important. So like, let's say you're visiting here from Wisconsin and you're gonna be here April 10th through April 17th. And you really wanna see uh, 
you know, you're wondering what you will see or think about migration. Am I going to be able to see tropical kingbird? Am I going to be able to see western kingbird? Will I be able to see black and grosbeak? All those, you know, all these different birds come through at different times. And that's an important thing. It's not something that uh, we always think about inherently, like, all right, spring migration, blue grosbeaks are coming. Uh, but blue grosbeaks don't come till later in migration most of the time, like very buntings. They don't come until like mid to late May. So when you're planning your trip here, um, so people say, oh, I'm going to there in April and I'm going to catch red faced warbler and I'm going to catch Wilson's warbler. Well, red faced warblers don't come until kind of the end of April. So to learn these things, both experientially, by being out there, and you, learn through you can learn it through um, you know, asking folks. Uh, but it's really important to think about, like when you go to a location, what birds am I going to be able to see? Well, we're going to talk about Montosa Canyon. The birds you can see in Montosa Canyon this last week of March will be totally different than the birds you see there last week of April because some birds come at different times. And then along in May is, again, totally different. You will have very buntings when you go there the last weekend of March, but you will have those the last uh, weekend of May. So those are just things to think about. So here's some examples, tropical kingbird. Now, I didn't go and search all the different records through eBird. I just kind of looked at my own record. So this is experientially what I've noticed. Think through arrival times. When will tropical kingbirds arrive? And usually tropical kingbirds tend to arrive somewhere between May 5th and May 15th. And so at Sweetwater Wetlands uh, in Tucson, that's a really good spot to find tropical kingbirds. If you come before May, more likely you will not, you will not see one. Uh, if you come May 6th, there's a better likelihood, but if you come May 15th, you're almost guaranteed to see one. So that's a thing to think through there. Here's another example, Western Kingbird. You see the Western Kingbird, has got this nice white edge on the tail. That's a really good thing to look for there. When will Western Kingbirds arrive? Well, Western Kingbirds arrive earlier than tropical Kingbirds, somewhere between now around March 23rd, through April 2nd seems to be when I have a lot of my first records of Western Kingbird. So this is just to me what I've experienced. Here's the one. Black-headed grosbeak. Um, I haven't seen a black-headed grosbeak yet. I uh, have to wait till a little bit later in April. You know, um, a lot of times April is when I'll start seeing uh, black and gross beaks are coming through, whether it's sweet water or other locations um, mid to late April. So think through that, look on eBird, play around with some of the features on eBird to try and figure that out. Look at the monthly things, look at um, the location where the bird is seen quite often. Uh, and then you can scroll through all the different, in fact, here I'll show you real quick. Let's go to um, let's go to eBird here. I'll show you real quick how to do this. So if you go to the Explore feature for eBird, and you go over right here to the Species Map, you click on Species Map. I am Keyword. And tropical team fruit. And then it'll show you all the different locations where it's seen. Scroll in here. Let's go over to Sweetwater. It's going to be right here. You can see no sightings yet. And then you click on the Sweetwater little thing there. It's going to get all the sightings and show all the sightings from ever recorded of tropical kingbird at Sweetwater Wetlands. So you can see when it was seen for the first time each year. You just have to scroll down through all this. It might be an even 
better way of, of doing this, but let's go to 2022. When was it seen first? May 3rd. So a little bit, I think I said May 5th on the PowerPoint. The May 3rd is when it was seen for the first time last year. And then you can scroll down again. To Right Luke, here. You're, you're, Luke, you're still kind of stuttery and you're freezing up a little bit. I wonder if you should restart or something. A lot of people have, have mentioned that in the chat. Um, I don't know if restarting is going to work, but um, I've got everybody <laughs> unmuted or muted and all the videos look off, so I don't yeah. know. Well, are you able to hear me right now? Not, now you sound fine. Okay. Okay, well, in 2021 is five two, so yeah, right around that time. So just, here, I'll stop. Uh, I'll go back to the record chair. To this. Are you still able to catch me? All right, Tina. Is that flipping over to Montosa Canyon right there? No. Now it is. Now it is. Okay. So it's just a little bit, uh, quite a bit of lag then. Okay. So I'm recognizing Yeah, that. definitely I'm lagging there. Okay. Well, that was really weird. I don't know why I was doing that. I specifically went to my house to make sure I had good internet. Oh, just a second. Let me, uh, let me check something real quick. I'm sorry about this. Hold on just one moment. All right. Well, I just checked with I, I'm working from home specifically. Sure, I had better internet than I do at the office. Well, gee whiz. Hmm. It's well, not perfect, but I think we should just continue. I think it's good enough, you know. Well, and then my part, my <laughs> I have a candle in here and it just the alarm went off. I'm so sorry, guys. All right. Well, hopefully it's good enough. We're going to go for it here. Uh, so the, the spot that I really want to talk about today is Montosa Canyon. Uh, Montosa Canyon is a uh, beautiful area that is heavily burned, but doesn't really get a lot of mention like Madera Canyon does. It's just south of Madera. It's home of the Whipple Observatory. So there's some uh, a lot of different night sky stuff that happens through here. It goes up the top of Mount Hopkins. So Mount Hopkins is just south of Mount Wrightson. It's about 8,500 foot elevation at the top of Mount Hopkins. And it's um, mostly a gravel road. Some of it's paved. But as you go up the road, it just takes you through a lot of different habitats. Here's a, a, a map of what it looks like uh, for, for getting there. Yeah, uh, the freeway right here. You can now exit here's Green Valley up here to the north. You come down the freeway, uh, you can either take the Kanoa exit or the Motto exit and get on the frontage road on the east side of the freeway. You take Elephant Head Road. From Elephant Head Road, then you kind of you take a right and get on Mount Hopkins Road, and you just stay on that road the whole time. And uh, Hopkins Road it can be really good. There's um, some different um, lower elevation um, kind of uh, screw up desert kind of grassland areas that can be good for for different sparrows in season like pottery sparrow later in the summer uh, but you take this road and then it it stops here at the Whipple Observatory Visitor Center we'll talk about that a little bit and then it follows this kind of mostly gravel road all the way up to the top where there's a gate so we'll dive into Costa Canyon was just there on Saturday and doing a little bit of um, 
<laughs> a little bit of exploring and, and preparation for today. And I just have to say, it's like really is one of my favorite spots to go. And this time of year, it's, it's amazing. There are really uh, distinct specialty birds that you can find in the area, but there's a lot of just uh, the variety of bird species. It's just, uh, I think, something to behold. It's, it's, it's a really good spot. Uh, let me also share with you, hopefully this is gonna work with whatever internet connection we have. There's uh, Arizona Highways has a little article about the Mount Hopkins Road, so you can check that out. I'll put this in the follow-up email, but gives you some more information about uh, the road and the different telescope stuff that they have up there. It's pretty amazing. Uh, it's a this is a picture of what the road looks like from the top. You can see it's pretty windy at times, um, but the lower levels are. Uh, fairly easy to walk. You don't have to drive all the way up to the top for it to be a, a really good experience. You can also see here, here's a map. And again, hopefully it's showing, but you got Tucson up here in the north and you just travel down I-19 past Green Valley. This is the Santa Rita Mountains down here in the south. As we go in here, you'll see Madera Canyon. Here's the Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory. This is where Montosa Canyon is at. You know, a picture of, you know, kind of the topography of what this area looks like. Here's the observatory. And then we'll look at some of these other spots here. Now, here I say it's stop number one because it's the, it's the first kind of birding location I encourage you to explore in this area. Maybe not necessarily your first stop. It's not the birdiest uh, of the stops on this route, but it is the one that is um, on with the bathroom. So here's the bathroom right here. Every every time you go out birding, you got to know uh, where there's a bathroom. At least that's something that I keep in mind when I'm leaning field trips and stuff where, uh, where we can do that. Uh, so it's right at the beginning of the entrance of the canyon. As you can see it's a, it's a pretty well-defined area. I actually hadn't really even stopped here at the picnic area trailhead until this past Saturday, but I was really impressed with just um, what they had going on here. So not only do they have a bathroom, but they also have picnic tables with a little barbecue pit. So you can stop here and have lunch, maybe on your way back down or uh, just explore the area. There's little trails go all around. And it's a brand new Ebert spot. It looks like the Ebert spot was just created last year. So it's a very small Ebert um, list that's on there right now, but um, you don't want to use this hot spot for all the birding you do in Montosa Canyon, but just for right there at the um, picnic area and trails that are right around here. So it's kind of like, um, I, it's kind of like, um, Oh, it's a desert scrub, mesquite. There's a repairing area below it that you run into as you get into Montosa. But most of this, you know, you expect like cactus brands, ash flycatchers, fly catchers, Lucy's warblers in season. Uh, there's lots of cardinals, there's lots of pyroloxias. Later in May, I'm sure you'll get lots of blue grosbeaks. beaks. You can get rock run through here. Uh, but while, you know, we talked about cardinals earlier. This is a great spot for cardinals and pyroloxias. And whenever I'm in an area where you can get both of them, sometimes um, it can be a little bit confusing when you hear a cardinal or a pyroloxia uh, because they sound really similar to each other. And so I thought, um, so here's pyroloxia here. I thought I would play the songs of each of these so we can kind of get in our mind what to He's thinking of when we're get out of our car there at the picnic area and we start hearing these cardinals and pyroloxies around us. Which one is which? So they can be hard enough to sometimes tell in the field. Not in full screen, although here let me put that on mute. Okay, but you know, looking at the bill. There I unmuted myself. So here's northern cardinal. And 
and then here your Alexia. Deeper pitch, right? Different pitch. But I always like the areas where I can see both of these at the same time. Because it, it really does, like when you try to differentiate the two, it, it helps become a better bird. Even if both of these are common birds for you, uh, recognizing the differences in those can be uh, uh, a really, a really good thing. Just being mindful of that. So I really, there, the birding here at the uh, picnic area, um, especially later in the day as it warms probably isn't going to be the best um, because there's not a lot of shade. So you can either hit this thing first thing in the morning or come and just use it as a as a bathroom spot. But there are some good birds through here too. But the really good spot, like the best spot in the whole canyon is this place called the Culvert. And it's just down the road from the observatory picnic area. And you can see this is my wife in the middle of the culvert here. Don't recommend that. Uh, yeah, don't don't get in the culvert. There sometimes there's uh, a lot of water flowing through there. Sometimes there's not, but um, you don't really need to walk to the culvert. I thought that was a funny picture. But this picture on the right is a little bit what this area looks like. You got these oak trees that are growing in here. You got some good riparian thorns. This is what it looks like from standing on the road. You can see our shadows here. And here's the, the culvert and looking down into the culvert area. And um, this is just uh, looking down the road. You can see this picture here on the right. You can see our, our cars parked up here uh, a little bit further. And um, looking up the road. This, so this is just, I'm going to hopefully share. Hopefully this will show up. This area right here, you can see this is where the creek kind of crosses the road a little bit. So the creek goes here, there's, a, there's a, a, a ridge that goes on the south side here. But this area right here is the culvert area. You want to park just right here uh, where this little spur road goes down to the right. The culvert is just uh, to the east of that, just on the, the right side here. And you can pull off here. And then this is like a little camping area. You can pull up here and walk down into this camping area. It's a really good area for like crystal thrasher. There's hunting vireo in there right now. And then northern beardless cranulet right through here. And then this is just an outstanding area. This is also where you can get like specialty birds like black cap gnat catcher, eye striped sparrow. You can find Montezuma quail through this area all the way to the top, really. But probably the best spot in all of Montosa Canyon. And here's a here's a picture of a northern beardless cranulet, a uh, really small flycatcher. And here's here's a song. And Just love listening to that. And um, sometimes my ears don't always pick that up, like some of the higher um, range stuff I don't always get, but my wife was with me and she was like, I hear this this bird is going tee, 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 tee. And I was like, I can't hear that, but that what you described sounds like Northern Beerless Triangulate. And so we, she kind of took me over to the area where she thought we heard it. And sure enough, there it was. And uh, so, uh, it, this tends to be a really good spot for this little flight catcher that can be really hard to find. Um, other birds to look for in the area, 
uh, lots of rock wrens and candy toadies. Uh, there's a crystal thrasher, like I said. There's a lot of vireos in the area right now that have warbling and bells vireo on here. Uh, didn't catch any bells yet. Warbling comes a little bit later, but there's plumbius there right now, and it's not so report of cassins, and there's lots of Hutton's vireos. And of course, tanagers will be coming through soon. Same with Orioles. I think we had Bullock's Oriole around there, but all three of the Oriole species can be seen in this area. And it's uh, fairly easy walking. Like, as you can see it in this picture here, you can just walk along the road, just park on the side of the road and walk on the road, uh, which makes it really easy, just burning the riparian areas on either side. Uh, or as you can see in this picture on, on the right here, uh, this is the, the road or trail that goes down to that camping area. You just walk through there and there's big oaks on either side. And uh, you can walk down in there as much as you want. There's little spur roads that go around. And um, as we'll see later, there's um, there is kind of a um, uh, spur road that follows along uh, the ridge up to a spot uh, about, oh, I think it's about three miles uh, above it. So you could park your car up above, or I'll, I'll, show, I'll talk about that spot in a bit and park your car down here at this spot and you can walk down on this ridge, uh, on this road that kind of, uh, it, it's an offshoot of the of the main road that we'll be walking on or driving on. Uh, there's, I hate to ask some of the especially birds that are in this area. One is five-striped sparrow. So five-striped sparrows are kind of like this bigger, darker sparrow that they, don't always come out and help them like this guy is. They love to be inside the brush, inside this really thick thorn scrub. And many times you'll just hear them before you see them. So here's what they sound like. There's a cactus right in the background too. So as you're walking along the road or walking along the trail or anything like that, you want to keep your, your ears intently listening for this guy. Uh, while he is a big sparrow with a big pig, he's very hard to find. Coloration really fits right in with all the thorn scrub. And he loves hillsides. So more often than not, you'll kind of catch him on the hillsides on either, either side, I think mostly the south side, I think is where they're mostly seen. Um, but they, they do like that, kind of the, the lower brush hillsides. And, and so here's the other thing with five stripes sparrow is that they used to be, where I mean, they still are fairly hard to find in Southeast Arizona, but this Montosa Canyon spot, uh, is along with Box Canyon, which is north of Madera, two of like the major spots where uh, people go to see this bird. It used to be California Gulch, which was a long, long drive way out west in Nogales. But this Montosa Canyon spot has proven to be much more accessible for people. Um, so that, that's good news there. So here's another one, Black Cat Gnat Catcher. Black Cat Gnat Catcher, uh, is very similar to some other net catchers that you can see in Montosa Canyon. Uh, you can get blue gray in the higher elevation, you can get black tailed at the picnic area, and you can get black tailed right through this culvert area as well. Uh, but black capped is also in that area, and they can be kind of difficult to uh, tell apart. But you want to look for the white under the tail, the gradation, kind of like you see how there's like a one little feather ring here and then there's another another ring is so it's kind of like predated i think that's the word for it um like on top of each other but really white under here it has a longer bill than black tail net catcher so you want to look at those different things but then also the sound again a lot of these birds you know they like to be deep in the thorn scrub or you know they're hard to find in, in the oaks and the mesquites and Here's, uh, so you gotta listen for them. Here's black cap net catcher. Uh, 
be distinctive call and um, can be pretty loud. It's something that um, even my ears can pick up at times. So um, they they do like to be um, kind of mid to upper um, story in the mesquites and in the, the oaks. So just kind of look at different levels there. Uh, normally, I see the mid to upper level in the canopy. So that's one that right around the culvert area, then down into that little camp site area can be really good. I did not see the black cat neck here when I was there on Saturday, uh, but I think uh, someone did, or that people have recently. And uh, five stripe sparrows will come up. I think they, they're a little bit migratory, so I, I don't think they're all. Maybe they're right now, or maybe they aren't as vocal. Kind of have to wait for them to be vocal. The other one to really look for through here, and then all the way up the rest of the elevation in different spots as we go up Montosa Canyon is Montezuma quail. Man, they, they're they one that so many people want to see. So hard to find. Um, so you just kind of have to get lucky. The best way to get lucky is to put yourself out there in the habitat that they prefer. And this really is the habitat they prefer from the culvert all the way up to the top. Here's, uh, they kind of sound like a, uh, kind of have like an alien UFO kind of sound to me. Here's what they sound like, the male. I don't know why, but to me, it sounds like a UFO taking off or something. Uh, at least that's how I remember it. Got to be able to remember these bird calls somehow. But Montezuma quail can be seen in here. And so just keep your eyes open. And when you're walking around on the any trails or uh, just be real mindful looking on the ground. That's why I tell myself and when I'm out and with other people, I kind of think through out loud is, just looking at all the different um, uh, levels within the canopy, all the way down to the ground, and you know, different birds live at different different um, heights off the ground or on the ground, or up in the canopy. Just thinking through all that. A lot of times we won't look on the ground for the quail or the rattlesnakes, so just be aware of all that. Um, let's move from the culvert and go up further. So all the way along Montosa Canyon are little, um, they're not mile markers, they're kilometer markers. So you'll see a, a 1K marker, you'll see 1.5, you'll see a two all the way up. And so right about the five and a half K mark, there is a pull off that's gonna be off to your right and kind of a juniper mesquite habitat. Uh, kind of grassland uh, area as well, and can be a, a good spot to stop. Not only to, to bird that area, but as you see here, this kind of parking area, there's a road that goes off to the right right here. This goes down the hill, and this is the road that I think it's about three miles where you can hike down this road, and it'll take you down into uh, the culvert area. So if you park the car up here, go down and park the car down at the culvert or vice versa. Actually, I would park at the culvert and then come up here so you walk down and not up. Uh, you walk down. And it's a nice walk that takes you through a, a few different habitats. And always think about habitat when you're out birding because you go through different ones and you get different birds. So here in the juniper mesquite, it's a really good spot for bush tits. Uh, saw a lot of the bush tits on Saturday. And um, bush tits, uh, rufous crown sparrows, bridal titmice, there's woodhouse of scrub jay. Surprisingly, this whole Montosa Canyon, Mount Hopkins Road area, is really good for woodhouse of scrub jay. We heard them a whole bunch from this point all the way up. So um, there's also some Mexican jays that were down in the Culver area. So you get a couple different jays through here. So another good spot for Hutton's Vireo. So you'll have like these little 
at least right now, these little flocks of hunting vireo and bridal tit mice and bush tits and white breasts and nut hatches all kind of working together. Oh, and I just had a Harris on my outside my window. That was cool. So another bird to really be listening for in this type of habitat is rock wrens. In fact, really all throughout this whole road, really good for rock wrens. Uh, here's a poor picture that I took of one, but it's kind of cool. It's like looking up. Um, but here's what you want to list, listen for for rock wrens. They have a really loud call. You know, all wrens can just be so loud. They uh, they really make their presence known with their song, with their calls. And we're thankful for that because they can be hard to find. But this whole road is really good for, for rock wrens. You should be hearing them quite a bit. Now, as you go up from that five and a half K mark, uh, once you, you, the road kind of winds around a, a whole bunch. And some of it's hay, some of it is gravel. Uh, it's, it's kind of a crazy road. In fact, there's a lot of these times right here slow proceed with caution so just be once you get up about that uh five half mile marker or k marker the road it's not a bad road by any means it's uh pretty well taken care of actually but it can be uh steep and uh, there's a bunch of curves and stuff like that so just be mindful of that but here this is the top and you can see here's uh, Mount Wrightston. And so you can see like how high we're up there. This is kind of like a Mexican evergreen. Mm -hmm. There aren't a lot of pine trees or there's a few pine trees, not too many, but it's mostly like uh, junipers and oaks and there's some sycamores in there. And, you know, just kind of that higher elevation type of uh, evergreen trees, but not so many pines. And there's a gate that uh, you can see that uh, you have to have special permission to go up to the very top where the uh, special telescopes are at. So you, you get to this end of the road here and you get that cool picture of, of Mount Wrightston. There's also a, a couple different pull offs up there where you can stop and walk around and stuff. But there can be some really interesting birds from about the 9K mark up to the gate. Uh, they're in season. There'll be uh, dusky cat flycatchers for sure. You'll be hearing them a lot. This is what dusky cat flycatchers sound like. Just that kind of whistle, plaintiff whistle. Um, but higher elevation birds like Arizona woodpecker will be up there. Blue gray gnat catcher, Townsend's warbler. There's reports of elegant trogans in some of the shadier spots where there are some sycamores. Um, in fact, there was one really shady spot where um, there wasn't any snow, but there was definitely like, you could tell that there was fairly recently quite a bit of snow and there was some ice and stuff like that. And right in this one area uh, had a cassis pinch. So hopefully the internet will hold up and you can see the video of this little cast and stitch, cast and stitch. Oop, wrong spot. There we go. It's like really close to me. The cast and stitch is one of those higher elevation finches that um, sometimes can be hard to find in the Santa Rita Mountains, but um, been a pretty good year for them this year. And so that, that just kind of gives you an idea of um, what elevation you're at. Uh, some of these uh, birds that we associate, I mean, your tail, I mean, yeah, you, the park, you're probably at about uh, 55 to 6,000 feet up. And then uh, when you get to that turnaround spot, it's probably about 8,000. So uh, you're high up. You can feel the elevation when you're out walking around. 
uh, and the birds express that too. So you get to go from you know cactus friends and black-tailed gnatcatchers and pirilotskias all the way up to broad-tailed hummingbirds and Townsend's warblers and dusky cat flycatchers. So it's um, not really you know we think of uh, going through all those elevations habitats when we do Mount Lemon or even to a, a lesser extent, Madera Canyon, but Montosa is a, is a great spot to experience that as well. Not as much traffic, not as much other people there, you know, birders go up in there, and uh, but it's, it's pretty low key, and especially the lower elevations, it's really easy to get out and walk around. Any questions on Montosa Canyon? Feel free to unmute yourself. And we can answer some of those questions before we get into a couple other spots I wanted to talk about. Um, Lou, there, there was uh, Peggy Steffens asked what mile marker the culvert was. Yeah, it's not at, even at 0.5k. It's, it's so if we go back to the um, to the map. So here's the Whipple picnic area, and right. It, this is actually a really short section right here, and the culvert is just just past the picnic area. So for for reference, the five and a half mark where that um, you can see right here, this is the road that you can walk. Um, this is the five and a half k. Oh, I just had a thing that says my internet connection is unstable again. Some of again. Um, yeah. Hopefully it's all right. But if you can see this this road right here that my arrow is falling, hopefully you can see my arrow. That's the one that you can walk on. Not really a road to drive on. It's a road you can walk down. So this is the culvert here. And then this right here, over here on the right, is where that five and a half K mark is at where you can drop down that road. So that to give you an idea. Here's here's the five k five and a half k and here's what the pullout looks like. So it's right on this corner, and you can park here. It's kind of like a camping. Yeah, you're cutting out again. Frozen. Come on, wake up. Lost you. Um, Mike Unger just said somebody observed 32 species at the culvert today crystal thrasher, orange crowned, and black throated gray warbler. If anybody can hear me, I'm the host now. Well, that's great. <laughs> I so can hear you. You can hear you. Can, you can hear me. Well, good. I'm glad. I don't know what happened to Luke. He disappeared. But the um, in the yeah, chat. I'm back I, now. I'm so sorry. I'm so okay. sorry. About this. I got to be the host for a minute. Um. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I'm so sorry, guys. Um. Yeah. So let, let's get back to it. Were there any other questions about Montosa Canyon? Um, yeah. Somebody was asking about the road. Several people said that it was good for yep. two-wheel drive. You were just up there last Saturday. Yeah. What, what do you think? No, that's a, that's a really good question. The road is definitely drivable, not only in an SUV, but uh, uh, a Prius to get up there uh, easily. It's, it's uh, you just take your time. It's just more curvy and steep in, in some instances, but there's um, it's not like you're having to drive over like uh, any rocks or big pits or anything like that. It's a really nice road all the way up there. Yeah, and and Nancy in, in London is saying, yeah, this is an area. And it's an area I've never heard of either that uh, I had that she hadn't heard of. It's great to to know this is up there. So, um, yeah. got a couple of people asking about birds, like, and I think we got a good. Just somebody asked about a five stripe, the difference between that and a black throat. And Peggy Steffens posted a picture that showed the white stripe down the 
middle of the throat, which definitely showed the difference. And then another person was asking about the Pacific float versus the Cordilleran flycatcher, and how do you tell them apart? And somebody mentioned it was um, mostly boys for the, those yeah. two. Yeah, even the, the voice of the Pacific Slope and Cordillera can be really tough to pick out. Um, you know, Pacific Slope, notably one that's lower elevation, Cordillera, notably higher elevation. Places like Montosa Canyon, that can kind of be tricky because, um, you know, the, the high elevation and the um, low elevation are so compact and close together. Uh, so that can be really difficult. Um, when it comes to five striped sparrows and black throated sparrows, the big thing to think about is shape and size. So, like five stripe, heavier, bigger, much, much Big thicker feet. bill. Much, much. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, perhaps you can include a description of how, where to find the culvert stop when the link for the recording is sent for us. In other words, they want to. Are you sending a link or are you just posting it on YouTube? Oh, I'll send a link once it's posted on YouTube, hopefully uh, later this afternoon. Okay. Um, Mike then, also asked what time is best to start. And so like, yeah, for a place like Montosa Canyon right there, uh, I like to get there as early as possible. Um, you know, sometimes when the, the sun, you know, in the, in the canyon, the, not all of the parts get the sun right away, which can be good, but then also, you know, like there's that time when the sun first hits an area and the birds just seem to be uh, singing and going crazy right at that time. So, you know, <laughs> if we can time it to be there right when that sun is just hitting some of those areas, it be a little tricky. But, uh, you know, the mornings, especially as we get into April and May, uh, that's probably going to be the best, you know, before it warms up. And then Karen, yes, I'll, I'll definitely share a better description of where to find the culvert stop. I, my plan was to show a little bit more through Google Maps and everything, but with, for, I just really apologize for, um, I tried to do the best to make sure that the internet was working well and everything, and for some reason it's just not today. Um, it's very, yeah, I'll send, a, I'll send a little Google Map of that and a specific link of, of uh, where where to go to it's just down the road it, you you'll see the little pull off to the uh camping area just on right just as you come down past the picnic area um let's see i'm having trouble making my screen respond now so find out if there's any more questions <laughs> yeah there's a little bit of time you know like if my internet is working well, I'm just gonna see if I can work through. Um, just wanted to share one other thing, you know, like after you do Montosa Canyon, uh, the model sewage treatment pond is really close uh, to the uh, elephant head road that you take to get into Montosa. So I don't really encourage people and stop myself to check out that model sewage treatment pond. And I'll show you on the map where it's at, but you know, there's 137 species that have been seen there in April. It's really easy to see where my Jeep is parked here. You don't even go to it, you just get out of your, you park the car here and I'll show you on the map. And, and then you get out and you look through the fence into the pond and you can find all sorts of different things. You know, later in April and then May, you'll get black bellied whistling duck. You always get a lot of spare, uh, a lot of swallows flying all around. It's a good spot to study your swallows. Uh, lots of barn, uh, tree in season, lot of cliff, bank swallows coming through there. They're my best spots for bank swallow in migration. Uh, different shorts coming through, like black neck still or willet. Um, in fact, I have a lot of willet that I've seen there, kind of like mid to late April. Lark sparrows can be seen there, but lots of really weird rarities too, like elegant turn or redneck foul rope, red foul rope, uh, different goals. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty cool spot to check out and really easy. So we'll see, we'll see how my internet moves here if I can show you on the map. 
but you can see from here's the observatory in Mount Hopkins Road. And so you just follow Mount Hopkins, you know, see so you come on Mount Hopkins Road, you come right off of the frontage road at Elephant Head. And from the frontage road, you just go south. And then we'll go to a different layer here. Let's see if this shows up. So just south, right before the Amato, here's the Amato exit that you can take to get to the Elephant Head. You can see this pond. That's right here. This is the Amato sewage treatment plant. And right off the French Road, there's just this little pull off right here. And you just pull off right there and you can check in here. And a lot of times the black bellied whistling ducks will be resting on one of these little things that are out here in the middle. But they'll be all along the edge. You want to check all the edges of this for um, uh, willets and stilts. And then in the background, there's some larger mesquite trees that you want to look for Swainson's hawks uh, beginning in April. And it can just be a, a really good spot to check out. There's another uh, hot spot to look at, uh, possibly off the elephant head. Right before the frontage road, this is the elephant head, the Anza trail trailhead. And so this trail, you can see it goes out through some desert scrub to the north. It goes up to Canola Ranch. But you can stop here and look into this. Um, this is a big ag field right here that can host like Swainson's hawks and white faced ibises, maybe. And then uh, walk the trail and see what other. I, there's a there's a little eBird hot spot for here. It doesn't have a whole lot of checklist, but this might be a good spot to stop and go for a walk as well if you want. All right, let me go back to this yeah and it, like the elephant head uh the danza trail head the head a good spot for rufus wing sparrow um a few other even hot spots to keep in mind here as well i'm gonna stop my share are there any other questions that y'all might have yeah, Mike Unger was asking if the yellow billed cuckoo was still nesting in the summer. Uh, yeah, Mike, are, are you meaning up on, on Mon Montosa? Yeah, Montosa Canyon, you can get yellow billed cuckoos through there, it, right in the culver area, in the riparian area. So you, where the big oaks are at, yellow billed cuckoo will, will breed in there. They're one of, thinking through like when birds arrive. Uh, yellow bill cuckoos are probably our, along with desert purple martins, one of our last arriving breeding species. Okay. So yellow bill cuckoos won't come until like the first or second week of June most of the time. Well, that was all I think that I, well, there were some earlier questions that I think were answered by other people. Um, Nancy Davis asked about a best place near Oro Valley for young children six to eight years old and Ethan Meyerson said that the Mason Center was good. Do you know any other places? Yeah, near Oro Valley. Uh, I mean, Tohono Tool might be a good spot. Right. Yeah. Yep. Valley. Uh, I talked about it. I Lou? Lou? Yes. Lou? Yes. Um, they just opened a children's museum at Tohono Tool, too. Just yeah. so that, yeah. Yeah. That um, also, somebody was asking how long a drive it is from Tucson down to uh, up, down, I guess it's down to Montosa Canyon to that area. I like this, the culvert, for example. Yeah, you can hear that. I'm sorry. Um, the whole internet thing kind of got me off my rocker there. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's about an hour. It's about 55, uh, a little, yeah, I would say about 55 to 60 minutes to the um, the Whipple observatory picnic area and uh we can we can figure that out here real quick just to confirm so let's go to whipple observatory here on google it'll direction. probably be a little more than an hour for like uh, i live on the far east side and for me to get down to Kanoa ranch it's about an hour so a little yeah further i depending down. on where you live in tucson it changes for everyone so like uh if you just put in tucson here it's about yeah 50 minutes 
So yeah, it's about 55 minutes usually for me to get from Tucson to the Whipple Observatory. You can see the, uh, how to get there as well, right there. And then the, uh, the culvert is just right there. So if we went there instead, uh, let's see what it Fifty-two minutes. It only adds two minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, it's really close. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and Peggy. Yeah, the culvert's the hot spot for five strat there. That that's, um, that's where like if you go to Montoso, that's going to be where you spend the majority of your time burning. At least that's what I would suggest is, uh, and what most people do is spend a couple hours there in the culvert area. Just slowly walking along the road, different trails, listening, and um, checking the the thick stuff and for five stripes and a little movement in there. Yeah, that is the one K. Yeah, it's um, yeah. Uh, what would be the best time to go to Montana Canyon for the most number of species? Oh, Brian, that that's a good question. I would say mid to late April. I would say April 24th. That seems like a really good day where, like, you know, uh, most of the migrants are coming through, you know, like thinking through when things come. But then some of the wintering birds, some of them still might have not have left yet or moved to higher elevation. So, like, somewhere between like, April 16th and April 27th. <laughs> That's kind of when that, that would be. A, Just throw those dates out there, Luke. <laughs> no, I really do. Like April 24th, like I think that there's something about that time frame. Like whenever I think about like when I'm doing a big day or something like that, it's always like that. Um, that last week of April or, or the, the third week of April. So right in that time frame, it seems to be when the wintering migrating breeding birds where they kind of convert a little bit. So like I'm thinking through right now, like when my son and I are going to be doing our big day for the Tucson Audubon Birdathon and to decide between Saturday the 22nd or Saturday the 29th. Uh, uh, so I made the decision yet. But also maybe something that y'all should be thinking about too. If uh, you're participating in Tucson Audubon's Birdathon, is um, think about what day you want to do that when you see the most species. That's a good question. So uh, Susan Susan asked for raptors. What's the my best suggestion for looking for raptors? Well, if you're here in March, say go into the Hawk Watch down at Two Back at the Ron Morris Park would be the best spot but if you come a little bit later i really like um la cienegas and empire ranch you can get some lingering northern harriers there or maybe even some that are breeding in april you can get white-tailed kite you could get swains and hawks coming through zone tails flying over red tail hawks american kestrels i like la cienegas and empire ranch area Um, Paul asked, what's the best time for Box Canyon? As a, a direct message to me, but you know, Box Canyon, very similar to Montosa when it comes to timing, when it comes to bird species. So, like what you find in that culvert area of Montosa will be maybe the same bird species that you might get uh, in Box Canyon. Um, so, just that same timing is, is about the same. Yeah. So, hey, I want to say thank you to all, especially thanks to you, Tina, for helping me out. Uh, thank you for your patience and working through internet things. Uh, shoot. Um, you guys are uh, very forgiving there, so I appreciate that. Thanks to all of you for being part of Tucson Audubon's mission to inspire people to protect my birds. You guys do that in a lot of ways, not only by showing up to things like this, but through membership 
and through uh, generous donations, volunteering. So I really appreciate all that. We, yeah, you know, it's good to be part of a team and a, something bigger. So I should have said that at the beginning, but I'll say it now. And um, you guys have a good rest of your week. Hope you guys get some good learning. Feel free to email me anytime with questions, and I'll see what I can do to respond as quickly as I can. And um, yeah, thanks again, Tina. Sure. All right. I'll see you guys later. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.